I was thinking as I was beginning studying this week that I would uh, just do one sermon and as uh, it comes to, usually as it follows suit with me, it's going to become a series. But I want to deal with the coming shaking. How many know that there's shaking going on right now in the world? We're seeing the advancement of ISIS in the Middle East and the crucifixion and beheading of Christians in unprecedented scores. Just this week, there was a uh, retired four-star general in the Air Force who basically asked the question, because they're saying we can only do so much with airstrikes, and here we have a four-star general in the Air Force asking us, are we allowing ISIS to win? So, actually, there's probably a whole lot more that we can do than we realize that's available. Uh, We're also seeing what what we call the Ebola scare of 2014, and seeing the advancement of that, and, and... With all this, I see a shaking. People looking, saying, this is it. This is going to be the Ebola that takes over the world. I don't think so. I think it's going to eventually be contained in the next few months. But I want you to look at the grace of God. The the federal government keeps on telling us that they are the source of our supply. That was one of the things that Nimrod did with Babylon, that you had to ascribe your happiness to his government. And we're seeing the same thing with the federal government today, although we're seeing... Uh, a lot of blunders with this, the basic handling of this Ebola scare. They're blaming the second nurse that was infected because she had the audacity to get on a plane while she had a fever and fly back from Ohio to home. What the press is not telling you on major networks is that she called the CDC three times and got permission to fly. She was concerned enough. They said, well, it's not, it's not a high enough grade fever. Go ahead and get on the plane. There, there's bundling going on, which I think God is, is saying, listen, there's, there's some places that uh, there's gaps. And in, in this particular area, our medical community is so ill-prepared for this. And so I think God is shakening to, to say, listen, it's time to wake up to some things. It's time for the medical community to wake up some things. We're also beginning to see the suppression of the church's voice in America. This last week in Houston, there is a, a lesbian mayor that has demanded sermons of every pastor in Houston that they're going to begin censoring them. And there has become such a backlash that she has now begun to back off. We need to realize in America, now it may be different in other countries, but in America, our conscience and our watchmen have been via two avenues. The free press, which hasn't been free for the last 100 years. It was bought and paid for by J.P. Morgan in the early 1900s. And how many are frustrated with the news? I mean, it's just, come on, tell me the truth just once. Come on, I dare you. Just tell me the truth just once. And the other avenue was the church, and a lot of the church is being bought off by the elite. Uh, I document in the Shinar Directive that uh, their ministers are even being paid to teach this generation to stand with Palestine and against Israel. It's amazing what's going on. And and so there's a certain part of it that has abandoned the gospel. There's a certain part of it being paid to abandon the gospel. And then the rest of it they're trying to suppress. That the church does not have the right to speak to the social issues of the day. The church has historically always had the right and the responsibility to speak to the issues of the day. Yet that is being suppressed. We're also seeing economic woes that have been going on for some time. And so we're we're seeing this shaking going on. So I want to start today in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 29. We're going to be spending a lot of time in the book of Hebrews. In fact, I came to the realization this morning that in one of the projects I wanted to do next year was to write Remnant Warfare. But before I do, I think I'm going to have to develop my own commentary on 1 John, the book of Hebrews, and the book of Acts. How many know that... uh, probably remnant warfare is going to get postponed until about 2016, which actually gives me hope. If God's telling me to write this stuff, I mean, we probably have a little bit more time. But I, I want to share some things, and let's, let's pick up here in verse 25. It says, See that refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, 
as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom that cannot be removed. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and holy fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, there's a lot of this. I'm going to have to do a little bit of backtracking. I, I tried to find the, the, the proper place to begin starting in the book of Hebrews to really deal with this whole issue, and I almost found myself in Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. because it, it, it's all one thing. In fact, for those that know me, I'm already at the end of my notes, which and anybody that knows me goes, uh-oh, because there, there is so much here. Now, he's, he's referring to Mount Sinai, to Mount Zion, and if they, refi- and they refuse the voice of God at Mount Sinai, they, they refuse to hear Moses, and they perished in the desert, and he said, listen, there's a voice that's now speaking, and actually the voice that's speaking, if you read the verse above it, is the voice of the blood of Jesus that his voice now speaks better things than Abel. But I, I want to really get into this and to get a dynamic. We need to understand that every generation since the cross has been prone to go to sleep. The apostle Paul in the book of Romans said, wake up out of sleep. I mean, we're, we're not even to uh, AD 50 and 60, and he's saying, wake up, church. 20, 30 years into this thing, and they're falling asleep. And we have had generation after generation yield to the Pied Piper of Babylon and go spiritually asleep. And so I think by the grace of God, every generation has a shaking. Because what's the first thing you do when you want to wake somebody up? You shake them. And it's by the grace of God that that happens. But I, I think it's also, as, as it is like a, you know, how you have pre-earthquake tremors, I think the shaking is going to become more intense because the, the force of Babylon to put the church asleep is becoming more pronounced and pronounced in the earth, and we're more apt to go to sleep. And so the shaking is getting harder until we get to that ultimate shaking, which is going to happen during the tribulation period. But part of the reason for the shaking, and we're going to be spending... Uh, all of our time in the book of Hebrews. I'm not going to create slides uh, for the video because be, if I do, I'll be making 500 of them, and I don't really intend on doing that, so I want everybody to follow along in their Bibles. I want to go back to, uh, let's see, where do I want to start? In, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. Now, he's talking about there are some things going on in the last days, and we're, we, we've got some decisions to make. That's why the shaking is coming. We're either going to stand with God, and we're going to yield to what God is doing, or we're going to find ourselves on the wrong side of the fence. We're going to find ourselves on the wrong side of the track. We're going to find ourselves where the hammer comes down. And how many know that that is not where you want to be? You want to be on the side where the hammer delivers because it comes down on, what that, that, on that which is oppressing. Actually, I want to go up to, to 28 because he, he deals with some things. He deals now, you know, at Mount Sinai, when they rejected what Moses said, this is what happens in verse 28. He that despises Moses, Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Mm-hmm. Say, man, that's rough. That doesn't sound like grace. Look at the next verse. And how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be wrought, uh, wor- who be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he sa- was sanctified an unholy thing and hath despised and hath done despi- uh, despised unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongs to me and I will uh, recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, what he's talking about here, for us to understand it, we've got to turn back to Hebrews chapter 6. And I want you to do that. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Because one of the things that we see, how many know that there's nothing new under the sun? Part of the persecution that happened to the early church, after what we see in the book of Acts, or the first part of the book of Acts, is that we had believers, Messianic believers, that were filled with the Spirit of God. They had, they had seen miracles. They saw these things, and they began renouncing that Jesus was the Messiah, and they went back into traditional Judaism. And they became the leading force on persecuting Messianic believers. 
And so the book of Hebrews deals with this, and it says, for is, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, enlightened, and, and Scripture talks about that the light of the gospel came to you, that you understood the gospel, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good works of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And so what he's saying, listen, these people have denied Christ, which is the unpardonable sin. We're seeing that today in the church. People have taken grace to an extreme. We have done away with sin. If we have done away with sin, you do away with the need for a Savior. They are denying his Messiahship. They're denying everything about this word, except there is a, a, at least a, a good code to, of ethics that we should follow as long as you don't mess with people's sexuality because we can't pay attention to that. But there's other ones like thou shalt not steal and you better obey your government and all these other things that, that they try to extrapolate out of the word that they say, this is things that you must do. What they are doing, and as you, you go into the book of Hebrews, the blood of Jesus speaks. It talks about the sprinkling of the blood and the sanctifying of the blood. If you do away with that, and people are doing away with that in their preaching, they're doing away with that in their teaching, they're doing away with that in their belief system, and they are denying the Messiahship, the very purpose that Jesus came, and now they are going to become the major adversaries of those who pick up their cross daily and follow him. Tom Horn in the, in, in the book, uh, the Christian versus Christian war, the blood on the altar. The reason I think that he understood this is he understood some of the things that have gone on before in Christian history. I mean, you don't even have to look back that far. One of the problems as communism began to expand both in Russia and in China, the most dangerous individual for the body of Christ is someone that got offended at the gospel that was a believer and got offended at the gospel and bought the Kool-Aid. They knew the lingo. They became infiltrators, they became persecutors, and they hated Christians with a vengeance. This is part of what's going on. Unfortunately for a lot of them, their, their livelihood has been behind the pulpit and they've got large churches, so now they spread their venom from the pulpits. That's part of the reason for the shaking that's going on. I, I'm get, for the for, you know for, with, with with biblical life college and seminary, we we primarily cater to those that are called to the fivefold ministry. But I'm going to have to modify my catalog because I'm beginning to hear from people say, "Listen, I'm not called for ministry, but I'm starving to death spiritually. I can't get it from my church." And so what I want to do, I don't, I don't necessarily want to study for ministry. I've got to study for my own family. I've got to study for me personally. Can I go ahead and take your courses even though I'm not called to ministry? And so I'm actually, I'm actually in the, probably in the, in the first position I've ever been in with the school. I'm, beginning, I'm going to have to begin advertising for that because it's there because Christians are looking for the place. And because I, I simply say we cater to those called to the ministry, they don't think that they can study with us. And that's not the truth. Anybody, any believer can study with us if they're hungry for truth. And, it, and I'm seeing it because the, I have had people just take one little, whether it's biblical life prayer dynamics or covenant faith, that have taken that one module, 16 lectures up to 20 lectures, and they have come back and they have said, I have learned more in that one course than I have in setting 30 years in church. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I had a son in the faith that finally got a wake-up call. I tried to give it to him about 11, 12 years ago. But he went down to a major conference down in Dallas, and this very well-known preacher rebuked several thousand ministers. He got up and said, listen, guys, when I was your age, all I had was the King James Bible, a strong concordance, and a dictionary, and I can preach circles around you. He went on to tell them that the only ones more ignorant than the, than the people they have in the pew of the Word of God are the people in the pulpits. You see, there's, there's a time of returning in this. There's a shaking going on right now that either we can rise up to become the remnant of God or we can fall away in that shaking. That's part of what that shaking is there. Either you wake up or you fall away. And this is exactly what God is calling us to. Now, with that said, 
Where am I wanting to... <laughs> okay, we have, we have covered Hebrews chapter 10 up to it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God in verse 31. So we're seeing this falling away. We're seeing preachers that teach that truth is like springs, that, that, that truth becomes a truth depending upon how your body weight warps it. That's not truth. That's Plato. Lies and illusion are malleable. The word of God, which is eternal, is like jumping on granite. It doesn't yield. You yield to truth. You don't shape truth to meet whatever you want. And that's what's going on in this day. But let's go, let's jump over here to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. And I'm just going to start reading and commenting on things because I think Paul in the book of Hebrews just did an outstanding job. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Well, everybody else is abandoning the word of God. And it may be the popular thing to do. The Apostle Paul, which I believe wrote the book of Hebrews, there's evidence that at one time it was connected to the book of Galatians. Because he dealt first with the Shemai Pharisees, then he dealt with the rest of, the, of those within the Messianic community to establish what he was trying to teach them. And he was saying, listen, with all this going on, people departing from the faith, with, with, all the, with, with persecution coming to the church, don't cast away your confidence in the gospel. They rejected Jesus, they will reject you. But if I hold fast to that which the word of God says, by walking in faith, I'm going to have great reward. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got a reward coming. You got a reward coming because you're going to be confident in who you are in Christ, what he has done for you, and that this word is eternal. Look what it says here in verse 36. For ye have need of patience. Now that's where you almost need to turn to each other and say, oh man. <laughs> you need to have patience that after ye have done the will of God that ye might receive the promise. Because there's resistance in the world that's going to take a little time for it all to shake out. But when it all gets shook out, there's a reward coming for you. There's a blessing coming for you if you hold fast. And what that shaking does... Have you ever seen an old panhandler pan for gold or they'll get this sieve out and they'll take it in a stream and they'll get all the dirt and everything out? And what do you end up with, if you're lucky? Gold nuggets. Nuggets of blessing. And with all the shaking that's going on, don't allow it to push you away from the Word. Cause it to pull you into the Word. As times get tough, we ought to draw nearer to God than ever before. You don't get offended at the gospel. You don't get offended at God. You realize that the spirit of Babylon is alive and well on the planet Earth today and is persecuting the saints and is trying to turn the people away from God so that it can redirect them toward the Antichrist. And the occult... And Satan's kingdom thinks over many generations. This is not something that has just manifested itself. It has been going on since the 1800s. It started with the concept of evolution, then eugenics, which prepared the way for the watcher's return. And now they're, now they're doing everything they can to move us completely away from this word. We need to wake back up. Now let's go on. For yet a little while, and he has said and that he will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul have, shall have no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith. Now we read that and we say, I'm just going to live by faith and I'm going to believe God. That's true, but that's not what it is saying from a Hebraic point of view. The just shall live by his faithfulness to the covenant. When you go back and you read it in the prophet's where it was first given, you look at the Hebrew, a just man will be faithful to the word. A just man will be faithful to that covenant. Uh, no matter what's going on, he presses into that covenant. He presses into the promises of God. He presses into the word of God, regardless of what he sees or regardless of what he goes through. He stays faithful. Therefore, the just shall live by his faithfulness. And, then, and so now the writer of Hebrews adds to it that God is blessed when you press in. But his soul takes no pleasure when you back off. How many times have we allowed social pressure to get us to back off of who we are in Christ? 
I, I, I've just about gotten to the opinion that I don't care if I clear a room as long as I clear it for Jesus. Come on. Everybody is so politically correct. Everybody's waiting to be offended about something. Well, I'm waiting to be offended about your resistance of the word. And I'll stand up for my king. I'll stand up for the word. And if you get offended at my offense because I got offended at your ignorance, then that's your problem. You see, I'm being politically correct in another kingdom. Because I'm a member of another kingdom. The kingdom of God. And you see, this kingdom is unique in in that I didn't elect him into office. He gave his life in my stead to be my Lord and my king. Let a president do that. Let an earthly king do that, to give his life and then resurrect from the dead so that he can rule and reign over the people that his own life and blood redeemed. If you can't do that, as far as I'm concerned in politics, you ain't got no game. No one compares to Jesus. And because of that, he's my best friend. I've gotten to know him. Once I heard the gospel, I got to know him, and I'm tired of people lying about him. We have tried to make him like he was from Detroit. Worst of all, we tried to make him like he was a politician from Chicago. All these things. He was a he 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 was a Jew. That not only was he a Jew, he gave the way of becoming a Jew to the Jews. (laughs) He gave the whole concept of being a Hebrew to Abraham. And said, now here are my ways, now walk in them. He's the one who gave the law to Moses. He's the one that promised in the garden, all right, Adam, you messed up, I'll fix this. I'll come, I'll come and I'll fix this thing. He's the one who lived the instruction of God that he gave to man perfectly. Died in our stead. Rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave three days later. And has been ruling and reigning in heaven, waiting for the time that he can come back and finish this thing up. That's my king. And because he has done so much for me, I get offended at people who trample it under feet. Now, some of the people in the world are just absolutely ignorant. They've been lied to about who Jesus is. My problem are the ones who have gone to seminary, who have gone and done other things. It needs to be turned around. Let's pick up in verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We need to determine that in our hearts today. I will not draw back. I will push in. You need to write that in the front of your Bible. I will not draw back from the gospel. I will not draw back from the word. I will not draw back from Jesus. Every time the enemy tries to push on me, I'm going to push further into Jesus' bosom. I'm going to push further into the word. I'm going to stand more fully on the promises. I'm going to become more determined to live this thing than ever before. You see, that is what has separated Christianity from all other religions is the harder that they have been persecuted in the past, the stronger they became. Have you ever read the book of Acts? The reason why that when they were in one place and in one accord and they prayed and the place shook is that they were being persecuted and they said, Lord, they, now they didn't say, Lord, please back off the persecution. You know, this is kind of rough. They said, would you please stretch forth the mighty hand of Jesus and do more? That's the kind of church I'm looking for. If you want to return to the book of Acts kind of church, that's the kind of attitude that you got to have is that I will not draw back. I will push in. And then he picks up here in, in, oh, chapter 11. I love chapter 11. you got to understand the first part of chapter 11 before you get into 12 because it's all one conversation. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Do you want a good report? You're going to have to believe the promises of God and the reality of God. Even though the whole world's going the opposite direction. It's getting ready to tell us that we can become God. It's getting ready to tell us there's no need for God. They're getting ready to tell us some E.T. somewhere came through the, through the cosmos and planted uh, alternation in the DNA with pamspermia. And altered our DNA and man took hold. 
when the truth is God created man, and there were aliens that came through. They were called watchers. They were angels that contaminated the gene pool, and God had to correct it with a flood for the sake of man. When you look at some of the things that was going on at that time, well, evolution tells us that we're evolving. When you actually look at who they were and the strength and the stature they had, that they're, they're covering it up because, in, in fact, what they're, from their view, we're de-evolving while they're telling us we're evolving. And morally, we are de-evolving. Civilization is nothing but a thin veneer with barbarianism underneath. And one of the things that concerns me is the government that was, helped, was supposed to help maintain the veneer is actually building the stuff up under the veneer for its own purposes. Look at this. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were made of things which do not appear. That kind of goes against everything they're finding out in science for those that interpret science incorrectly. I understand that there used to be nothing until God said, let there be something. And within our dimensional reality, the Bible teaches that there is a greater dimensional reality. It's called heaven. And God stood in eternity and created time, space, and he created all of it. Now, there are some physicists that are beginning to get a hold of this. Well, while in school they teach the world is millions of years old and all these crazy things and that there is no God, and they want us to believe that way back millions of years ago, there was one element, they can't tell us how it got there, but there was this one little speck of dust that was so compact when it exploded, the Big Bang Theory, that within that little, little itty-bitty speck was enough material to create all the planets and all the suns in the entire universe. Now, that is one compact suitcase, okay? Now, which is, which is more believable? That all the planets, all the stars, all, all, all the material in the entire universe was in a speck that, uh, that spontaneously exploded for some reason, and as it, un- it was like a zip file that as it uncompressed, that all the galaxies, all the solar systems, all these things came from that one speck in a moment, or that God said, let there be light. Which one takes greater faith? I think it takes greater faith to believe the science because at the same time they're denying things while they're, and because their, their attitude is wrong and their heart's wrong, they look at the very facts that reveal God and they don't see God. Just recently came out when they were beginning to examine the gravitational wave on the edge of black holes. I read this from Chuck Mester and I thought it was so awesome that they're seeing, they're, they're seeing gravitational waves and gravitational waves have more to do with our reality than we understand. And they said this, they said, we have discovered that very possibly that our entire universe is simply a manifestation of a higher dimension. That it's a holographic projection. Hmm, why do you have to have to have a holograph work? Light. Of a greater dimension, it was broadcast out of heaven because God said, let there be light. But at the same time, it causes them to question everything. They never return back to the Word to see that it's there. But yet those of us by faith, we believe that out of nothing, God created everything. Because all it takes is His Word for it to come to pass. And the more they try to disprove God, I I read their own writings and prove God all the time because I see Him there when they can't. Because faith sees where doubt denies. How many are glad we serve a God that one of these days the Bible says he's going to take this entire universe and roll it up like a scroll? You can also get into some parts of physics that actually says that even the darkness of space is made up of dark matter, and therefore it has characteristics that can be rolled up. It it has physical dimensions like fabric. Hmm. I remember years ago I've been trying to get this slide from Dr. Carl Koch that if you, have you ever seen Yeshua, the name, the name of Jesus written in Hebrew? He actually has a constellation that it wrote out in Hebrew, Yeshua, in the heavens. How many think maybe God's trying to make a point? How many know it's kind of hard for star clusters to write in Hebrew? And then to come up with the word Yeshua. It's written in the heavens. I believe. By faith, Abel offered, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, 
and of it him being dead yet speaketh. And Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, do you know that the, ca the catching away of Enoch is a type and shadow of the rapture? Although we need to kind of rethink the way that we teach the rapture, Enoch was raptured so that he could come back during the tribulation period. And we teach that we've been raptured so that we don't have to go through it. Maybe we do. But the thing that, that is going to get you as a part of that catching away, that harpazo, is that you pleased God. That you believed when the whole world did not believe. And then he goes on to say here in verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek them. You want blessing from God? You seek God. You don't run after the blessing. You run after the one who has the blessings in his pockets. I've got to believe that he is. And I've got to believe that as I begin to seek him, God, I want to know you. I want to know the power of your resurrection. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? He said, I count all, all my achievements. He was, he was a graduate of the school of Hillel under Gamaliel. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was on the top shelf as far as the religious system and the political system of his time. He was from a wealthy family. And he says, I count it all dung just to know Jesus. I throw it all away just to know Jesus. Let us have the faith of the Apostle Paul and say, you know what? I want to know him more than I want to know this world. I want to know who he is because when that shaking's coming, I want it just to kind of shake me on into him. I want it to shake me on into him. Then he goes on here in verse 7, by faith. Noah, being warned of God of the things not, not, not seen as yet. Can you imagine Noah? It had never rained on the planet. You know, we're talking about things like the mark of the beast and what, what the elite are doing and all this, and people are laughing at us. Can you imagine standing there and telling a people, water's going to fall from the sky? Yeah, right. Water has never fallen from the sky. The Bible says prior to that, it would come up as a mist from the ground. And then spend 120 years building a boat where there was no water. The whole time preaching, God is going to make water fall from the sky, and it's going to drown all you unless you get in the boat and repent. People mocked him. People laughed at him. But God so appreciated his faithfulness, not only was his family saved on the ark, that God also restricted man's lifetime to a maximum of 120 years and later on brought it down to 70 or 80. Because if you give a man enough time, he'll get into more and more and more trouble. All because he believed God and did that which looked ridiculous, speaking of that which was impossible. But yet when the, the impossible and the ridiculous happened, he was ready. And if you read the book of Revelation, that which is ridiculous and impossible is, is coming quickly. But I've got, to, I've got to prepare my boat. I've got to prepare my faith. I've got to believe God and believe this word regardless of what the word says. And when the rains come and the shaking comes, I'm prepared and I'm ready. And see, what, what I, the concern that I have for a lot of the body is you can have a basement filled with survival food and not be ready. If you're not spiritually ready, it's spiritually, then mentally, within your soul, and then physically, and it has to be in that order. Everything starts in the spirit, and if you're not spiritually ready, your neighbor will kill you and take all your food, and then your neighbor will be feeding on food and don't even believe in Jesus because you have to have that spiritual protection first. It's spiritual, mental, and then physical. Do you think David was, when he talked about, I believe in my God, and I'm, I'm, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall? You think he was able to do that because, because of physical prowess? He was a young kid and took down a Nephilim with a rock and a sling. It doesn't take physical prowess to do that. It takes faith in a covenant. 
And he was spiritually prepared, which enabled him that anointing to flow through him, through his mind and through his physical body to take down that which was standing against God. And in this day and this hour, what God is saying, although there is a shaking coming, it's a shaking to awaken you so that you could be spiritually prepared because that anointing can come on you to do the impossible when you're faced with the immovable, but that immovable is not of God. That's faith. We can see things turn around. By, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not uh, seen, uh, as not seen as yet, moved with fear. Now, you're going to see this over and over again in the Word of God, especially in the book of Hebrews, and that's talking about reverential fear toward God. He was moved with reverential fear toward God to be obedient to him, not to the world. You see, we all move in, in one of two types of fear. I can either fear the world, which is the wrong kind of fear that motivates me to do the wrong things, or I can, and the only way that you can replace that is you have to have reverential fear toward God. When I have reverential fear toward God, I am moved by God to do that which the world doesn't like, but I'm not moved by the world. It's displacement. Faith in God causes me to have reverential fear toward him. Doubt in God causes me to fear the world, fear the spirit of Babylon. We got we to kind of take uh, uh, our own kind of measurements today. What do I fear? Do I have the good kind of fear or do I have the bad kind of fear? If I'm moving in faith in God, I have the right kind of fear that I fear God. If I am filled with doubt and filled with the world and filled with, with uh, the things of the world, I will always fear the world and doubt God. Noah had a choice. He obeyed God. And he prepared an ark to saving of his house by which he, was, which, uh, by which he condemned the world. Do you see that in your Bible? He feared God, he obeyed God, and his obedience condemned the world. Oh, you don't have this yet. Let's start again here in verse 7. This is good stuff. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. He did what God told him to do, which saved his household, and at the same time, it condemned the world. When you obey God and move in reverential fear toward God, it provides safety for your household, and it condemns the spirit of this world. That's why we can say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. By which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is, which is by faith. There is a righteousness which is by faith. And you begin to move in that the first time you heard the gospel and responded to it. And made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Faith in him caused righteousness to be imputed to you. And the thing that we need to do is move in such a way in our lives that that righteousness continues to be imputed to us. And the blessings come. Verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was, when he was called to go out unto a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out knowing whether he went. And what we forget about Abraham, the reason that God, so many times the Apostle Paul uses Abraham, is Abraham was a pagan. He was a Gentile. He lived in Babylon with Nimrod as his king. And God said, pick up, get out of here, leave it all behind. And that is the same call that we get when we receive the gospel, is you pack up, you leave Babylon, you leave the world behind, you are moving into a kingdom that cannot be seen, that, but, but is on the inside of you, and there is a king named Jesus, and we'll have no king but Jesus. And I, when, I re, when I respond to that, it empowers me to leave Babylon behind, and if I continue to have faith in him, it keeps Babylon back where it's no longer controlling me. But it's done by faith. And by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as, as, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And he looked for a city who hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Do you ever, do you ever ask what, what, what was that city? 
What was it, Jerusalem, that David eventually built? What was that city whose maker and builder was God? He was looking for the new Jerusalem. The faith of Abraham causes the end of the book of Revelation to come to pass. He was looking for that new Jerusalem that came down out of heaven, whose builder and maker was God. And and also faith, though Sarah herself uh, received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged God faithful. She believed that which was impossible and received the impossible because she judged God as a God who keeps his promises. They say, now look at this brother and I just don't know. If you're saved, you're believing in a promise that you're not going to be able to substantiate until you're dead. So how have you judged God? Have you judged him faithful that when you die because of the shed blood of Jesus, when you get to the pearly gates and they say, why should I let you in? Are you going to respond because I have the testimony of Jesus and I am in blood covenant with Almighty God and that blood has washed away my sins and I belong in that place because my king is there. So you're hoping in something that you can't see, but you have judged God faithful in keeping that promise that the blood of Jesus is enough. There goes on, therefore sprang there even of many, and him as good as dead, yet so as the stars of the sky in the multitude and the sands which is by the seashore multitude. Now, I want you to look at something here. Now, I know that we're not going to see all the promises of God fulfilled in our life. Abraham and Sarah died before they saw Israel formed. But it goes on. But all these died in faith, not having received their promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them as they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You know, the quickest way for you to begin moving in faith is you've got to say in your own heart, I'm just a pilgrim and I'm a stranger here. I walk in another kingdom. I'm just passing through. Otherwise, the tenac- the, the, through that, the tentacles of Babylon can't get a hold of you. Now, God's going to bless me while I'm here. God's going to protect me while I'm here. But I'm not of this world. I was born into another world the day that I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. A greater reality. A greater kingdom. Some things I'm going to see now. Some things I'm going to see later after I have passed through the veil. How many know the book of Revelation is going to happen whether we survive to see it or not? If God should tarry, and this thing does, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, the, well, the tribulation period could happen here in the next couple of years because of the blood moons and the blood moon prophecies and the Shemitah year and the Jubilee year and the resetting of all these things. And I look at that and say, well, maybe, but I see maybe more like about 2030, 2035, and I have reasons for that. If Jesus comes back here in a year or two, how many know I'm going to be happy? I'm not going to hold on to the edges of these pulpit and say, Lord, could you just hold out for another 20 years? I want to get 80 before you come back. I'm ready. But I also have things planned that I want to do in the kingdom for him while I'm waiting for him to come back. And if he should come back after I die of old age, I'll get to come back with him when that trump sounds. And I'll pick up a resurrected body on the way through. But whether I see it completely in my lifetime or not, by faith I know it's coming and I will see it either here or on the other side. And whether I live or die does not affect the reality that it's going to be that way. That's when you're dealing with something that's greater than you. Verse 15, And truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now he's talking about them coming out of Babylon. Right now in the body of Christ, where we're, where we're lacking in faith is we keep on wanting to go back to Egypt. We keep on wanting to go back to Babylon. We're walking in the kingdom of God and we're worried about what Babylon thinks about us. How many know Babylon keeps on getting darker by the day? And those who function in Babylon get darker by the day. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to put pressure on us so that we turn out the lights. 
if we're the light of the world because the kingdom of God is shining through us and the faith of Jesus is shining through us, their only response to the light is put it out. Either they're going to yield to the light or they're going to demand that it be put out. And right now they're demanding that we turn down the lights. And now, it's t- that now is our opportunity to shine. There has to be contrast. The world has got to get more evil and the body of Christ has got to be more righteous for those that are lost to have a clear choice. That's why the shaking's here. Verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. I want you to underline that one in your Bible for this particular reason. The life that you're living now and the way that you're believing God, the way that you're believing the word, is God not ashamed to be called your God? I read that, and if I hadn't have been sitting down, somebody would have had to have picked me up. We always look at it from our perspective. Is God doing enough that I think I want to call him my God? God is saying, are you believing me enough that I want to be called your God? Talk about slap your mama. Yeah, we we take it for granted. God is saying, listen, Abraham and Sarah... Man, they walk by faith. They believe for the impossible. And I was able to do something. What Abraham and Sarah set into motion paid for your redemption. He was a man in blood covenant with God and was willing to give his own son Isaac, the son of promise, on an altar for God, which opened the door, if you understand blood covenant, to give God the right to offer his son of promise on the altar of the cross to redeem all mankind. And God looks at Abraham and Sarah and says, I know those two, I am not ashamed to be called their God. In fact, from this day forward, I'm going to be called the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. How would you like Almighty God, one of his names? I am am the God of Michael. I am the God of, of, of Troy. I'm the God of Micah. I'm their God. Did you see what they did? I tell you what, I want to put my hat on what they did. And you just say, I'm their God. Guys, there's coming a time. Whether the big shakings now or the big shakings later, the ones that are walking with God, we're going to have those that raise up in the name of another God that are going to try to to hurt you. And the testimony you want is their God won't let us. Do you know Israel has that testimony right now with the things that Hamas is doing, some of the testimony that has come out of Israel, that we had Hamas griping. We had these Islamic terrorists griping saying, we fire missiles and their God takes it off course. We have these plans and their God reveals them. We want to take all these lives and their God won't let us. Oh guys, we need to have that kind of testimony today. Those that are enemy God says, you know what? I wanted to destroy that family, but their God wouldn't let me. There's a God that lives in that household. There's a God that lives in the midst of that people. And he has hung his hat on their door and says, I live here and I'm their God. And Jack, you better back off. Oh, have have you read the Old Testament that when Abraham came back from Egypt, when they went down there and sojourned, the pagans around them, when he came back, basically in, in the modern vernacular, they greeted Abraham and said, we cool? We all right? You you still okay with us? They wanted to make peace with him because they knew that you don't mess with the God that he serves. Because he served a God named El Shaddai, which is another name for Almighty God. And it not only means God my supplier, it means God my destroyer. That's why the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, said, you know what? Now, I, I know you lied to me and you said that your wife was your sister, but all these things I gave you, just take them and leave because I don't want your God mad at me. That's faith. That's where God is wanting us to be. But you see, the only way that we can have a response by the world like that is we've got to have a faith like the faith of Abraham. 
We've got to have a faith like those in the hall of faith that we believe God, whether we see anything with our eyes or not. And when we have that kind of faith, God begins to move behind the scenes to move that which cannot be moved. Because everything first starts in the spiritual realm. You know, there was a time that Israel was surrounded by Syrians and they were starving to death. Because they, they had encompassed the city. And the guy said, you know, I, I need to have a way of, of removing this. So I'm going to send my prophet down. And so he's going to tell those in the royal court by tomorrow. Right now you're, you're selling pigeon dung for everybody to eat. But tomorrow there's going to be so much food that you're going to be basically selling bread for a penny a loaf. And the officials laughed at them. Laughed at the prophet. The guy says, you know what? As people stampede to get this money, or get this food for this cheap of money, you're not going to see it because you're going to get trampled by them. And God used a couple of lepers that were sitting there outside the gate saying, you know what, we're starving to death. If we go down there, they're either going to feed us, throw food at us, or kill us, one or the other. And God took the footsteps of those lepers and made it sound like an approaching invincible army. And the, and the enemy fled and left all their food. Because it starts first in the spirit realm and then manifests in the physical. And because there were those that were faithful to God, God made it happen. Took the impossible and made it possible with a couple of lepers and their footsteps on an old dirt road to chase off an insurmountable army. That's the kind of God that we serve. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was, was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he had received him in a figure. He was willing to offer up Isaac. The son of promise, and God says, you know what, I'm going to offer up my son, and, but my son I will resurrect. All because he believed God. His faith, thousands of years ago, are affecting us now. And every one of us that have received Jesus, we're grafted in and are called sons of Abraham. When you take not only all the Jews, but all the Christians that have ever lived, how many know that his descendants are as the sands of the sea and as the stars that fill the sky? All because he believed God. What's God calling you to believe? What's God calling you to believe today? What things is he saying, I want you to raise up in faith, and there's some giants that you've got to slay, and there's some things that you've got to overcome as I'm shaking, but just roll with my shaking and press into me, and I'll make sure that the rock in your hand takes down the giant that's in your face. You see, I, I think one of the things that, that God has been really dealing with me about is it's time for us to turn up our faith. It's time for us to get bold about this word and bold to believe this word. We are either going to end up in the hall of faith or the grave of doubt. Which one's it going to be? Let it be the hall of faith. I got a few more that I want to read that we're going to pin it here and pick it up next week. Is that all right? I need to I don't even know how long I've been preaching. I guess I'll find out when I edit the video. Pick up verse 20. By, I, but by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob, and then Esau concerning things to come. And by faith, Jacob, when he was, a di was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave them commandments concerning his bones. One of the neatest things that, you'll, that if, you, if you don't understand this, you don't understand Torah. He said, now you guys are going to be here. The, God had already told Abraham, Abraham that your descendants are going to go into Egypt. They're going to be slaves for a, a good number of years. And so Joseph knew that. And so he said, listen, I made this place for you, but it's going to get rough before I leave. When you go home, take my bones with you. And one of the neatest things is they're packing up everything after the Passover. They packed up Joseph's bones and took them back into the land. 
and buried him by his father. How many know that's good? That even his bones did not rest in a, in a strange land, but was buried in the place of promise. And by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months of his parents uh, because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Well, underline that one in your Bible. Which one are you going to be afraid of, the king or president's commandment or God's commandment? And by faith, Moses, when he was come of years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but rather, but choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Underline that in your Bible. You can either align yourself with what the world's doing right now and have some pleasures for a season, or you can align yourself with the people of God. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect and the recompense of reward. Now, I'm going to stop there, but listen. What, notice what Moses did when he chose God over Pharaoh and Egypt, which is, a, which is a type and symbol of the world as well as mystery Babylon. By him doing that, he was united with Messiah. Not only was he united with Messiah, but he came a type and shadow of Messiah. Moses said, there's one coming just like me. All because he would rather suffer a little affliction with God's people than to have the treasures of Egypt. Now I need to ask you today, American, do you want the treasures of Egypt or do you want to walk in the things of God? This, 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 there's decision-making coming. There's a shaking coming, and our faith is what is going to determine how we make it through it. We can either come on the other side of this as blessed and stronger in God, or we can walk on the other side of this lost forever. It's our choice. We're going to see here in the next couple of weeks, if you read a little bit further, it says, if we deny him who is speaking, how are we going to survive if they didn't survive in the desert? And it's the blood of Jesus. And so we need to ask ourselves, what's the blood of Jesus speaking in this day and this hour? Well, the first is to have faith. Have faith in the word. Have faith in the kingdom. Have faith in who you become in God. Have faith in who he is. And if I press into him, I become more than a conqueror in Christ. The apostle Paul wrote that when the church was being persecuted, not accepted. He said, you guys are more than overcomers. You see, because I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm looking for a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I'm looking for a kingdom that doesn't have to look to the Tao or what Wall Street is doing or what's politically correct according to whatever breeze is blowing through Washington today. I want a kingdom that is eternal, that cannot be moved, that its principles are always right and never changing. That's something you can base your life on. Not the other. And God is saying, listen, the shaking's coming, but this is your chance to get into the hall of faith. This is your chance to believe and to thrive and to move forward. Now, Father, I ask today in the name of Jesus that you would give us the grace. Father, that we would not be as some that have fallen away, that have denied the blood, that have denied the deity of Christ, that have denied the covenant. But, Father, I ask that we would entrench ourselves in your word so deep the enemy can't find us. Father, let us be so entrenched in your presence, in your promises, and in your covenant that we come out the end of anything, whether it be persecution or shaking, even stronger than we were when we went in. And, Father, loose that anointing in us to get deeper in your word and deeper in your purposes that we become firm in who we are who you are and the power of your promises in Jesus name